Thanks on Unsolved Mysteries. A young woman is brutally beaten by her ex-husband. You shut up! Then he targets her new boyfriend. A journalist and former stripper writes about the seedy nightlife she knows all too well. And then she disappears. 16 tons of gold may be buried somewhere in the New Mexico desert. Will the treasure ever be found? And for a female ramp supervisor in Boston, sexual harassment turns to murder. Join us for five cases with twists and turns that you can hardly believe. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Kingfisher, Oklahoma. 23-year-old Teresa Stamper leaves a small dinner party with her new boyfriend, Chris Butler. The quiet evening is a pleasant change for Teresa, who had just ended an unhappy and abusive marriage. Teresa doesn't know that her estranged husband, Paul Stamper, is parked nearby, watching her every move through a high-powered telescope. For six months, Paul Stamper stalked Teresa night and day. She was constantly looking over her shoulder, never knowing where or when he would appear. Paul Stamper was no longer the man that Teresa once loved. When Teresa met Paul Stamper, he was the owner of a thriving oil equipment operation. He had hired Teresa as his secretary. Paul was... Uh real charmer and you know i i worked for him and he took me places and we flew a lot of places and you know i was you know it was different for me you know hey teresa honey you been outside yet this morning it was on my birthday he called me about seven o'clock in the morning and said have you been outside and i said no so i looked outside you know and went out there and there's this 82 red corvette <laughs> That's what he liked to do. He liked to spend money and buy nice things. And I liked living like that, you know? It was fun, and, and we got married. Teresa thought that she was marrying a successful young businessman. In fact, Stamper was a convicted felon with a record for theft, assault, and fraud. She didn't know that his recent business practices were under investigation. We had unconfirmed reports that he went out and destroyed some equipment on locations so that those same people would call him the very next day and have him come out and repair it. Within six months, the marriage began to fall apart. You mind telling me where the hell you've been? I sent the grocery store getting dinner. Been gone for two hours. Now, who are you with? He started watching me and having people follow me, and he wouldn't let me visit my friends. I want to know who you were with, and I want to know it now! And in one moment, he'd be nice, and the next moment, he would hey, hit me, and I just, I didn't know how to handle him. Get everything for you, get you a nice place to live, and buy you nice things, and you just, you, you're running this around. This is crazy, I don't... You shut up! He was jealous. And you had better be here when I get back. I mean, I could be sitting at, we could be sitting at a red light, and I could just turn and look at someone, and it could be a, a guy sitting in his car, and he would just double his fist up and just hit me right in the mouth. I mean, it was just, it was unreal to the abuse that he did to me. Five different times, Stamper was arrested and charged with assault and battery. Each time, the charges against him were mysteriously dropped. He bragged to Teresa that he paid off the authorities. We had heard rumors that uh, that there was 
payoff attempts. Uh, whether it's true or not, I don't know. Um, we, we looked into a couple of incidents. We could absolutely find no basis for it, uh, but there was a lot of talk about it. The couple had only been married two years when the violence reached a new level. One night, a man entered the Stamper home. Teresa was out of town, and a friend of hers was staying over. <laughs> the woman survived the attack and called the police. She later identified her attacker as Gary Trout, a local mechanic who worked for Paul Stamper. Gary Trout informed me that Paul Stamper had contacted him and asked, and Paul asked of Gary to kill his wife and was willing to pay $5,000 up front and then $5,000 to finish it. Stamper was arrested and charged as an accessory to attempted murder. But at his trial, Gary Trout refused to name his boss. Once again, all charges against Stamper were dropped. Meanwhile, Teresa moved in with her parents, but she never felt completely safe. The threats continued. I had uh, went to the window and looked out the window, and there he was, just revving up the engine. And he just let me see him and let me know that he did it, and then he just drove off. Teresa reported the incident to the sheriff's department but that didn't stop the harassment. Then, life seemed to improve when she found a new boyfriend, Chris Butler. We were just driving down the highway, and you know we weren't speeding or anything. And all of a sudden, these lights come on, and we thought it was the highway patrolman. Paul. Teresa, honey, get out of the car. Get out of the car now! Come hey. no, Chris! What are you doing? Open the door, I'll shoot you through the okay. window. Come on! Finally, you know, he I was so scared that I just I unlocked the door. And he just grabbed me around my neck and just forced me out of the car. Chris had come to and he had yelled, Don't leave me here, you know. Teresa, don't leave me here. You know, and there, was, there wasn't anything I could do. A passing witness called the police. Chris was in critical condition. The bullet had punctured his heart, pancreas, spleen, and lung. But miraculously, he survived. Stamper held Teresa at gunpoint as he headed north. Two days later, they stopped at a restaurant in Topeka, Kansas. Is that it? That's it. Look, I gotta go to the bathroom. I was walking toward the restrooms, and I kind of looked around my shoulder, you know, to see if he was following me, and he wasn't. He was just sitting there with his back toward me. And so I just took off running. Teresa ran to the manager's office and begged him to call the police. By the time the police arrived, Stamper had vanished. Police quickly caught up with him as he boarded a bus in Salina, Kansas. He was brought back to the Kingfisher County Jail in Oklahoma to await trial. Six months later, a man who had been offered $10,000 by Stamper broke into the jail in the middle of the night. Don't turn around. Open the cell. Shut up. Shut up. Paul Stamper escaped. Update. Just minutes after this story aired, the FBI received information from several of our viewers that Paul Stamper was living in Commerce City, a suburb of Denver, Colorado. Only three hours later, he was arrested as he left his home. 
He had been living near Denver under the assumed name Gary Wickle for almost four years. This is one of the more efficient, uh, cost-effective, speedy apprehensions that we've ever made. For us to uh, not have any idea early evening that this individual is in the Denver area, and by 11.30, he is captured, he's off the streets, and he's on his way to Denver City Jail. That, uh, I think, may be close to a record for us. At his trial, Paul Stamper pleaded guilty to kidnapping, attempted murder, and prison escape. He was sentenced to 35 years and was released after 10 years. Next, an ex-stripper writes about the world she knows oh so well, and then mysteriously disappears. Nutley, New Jersey. Hey, David, while you're over here today, don't watch so much television, okay? Read a book or something. Susan Walsh is in a hurry. She drops off her son, David, with her estranged husband. She doesn't explain where she's going. Thanks, Mark. You'll be back, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I uh, got to make a couple of phone calls and um, run a few errands, okay? And uh, just a few minutes, right? But it wasn't just a few minutes. Susan never returned. Police believe Susan Walsh simply chose to disappear. Others, however, fear that she was swallowed up by the seedy sex industry. But the bottom line is this. Susan is missing. Susan grew up in a broken home. By most accounts, it was a bitter childhood. Still, Susan dreamed of being a poet. By the time she turned 20, she was far from her dream. She was instead a substance abuser, supporting herself as a stripper. Still, she kept her hopes alive, using her dancing tips to pay her way through college. By the time she graduated, she traded stripping for a writing career. Susan had been sober for over four years. She got married and became a devoted mother. Looks just like me. Susan loved her son very much, and she was always there for her son. The two things that meant a lot to her were her son and her career as a journalist. Eventually, she and her husband separated. Her writing jobs didn't pay enough to support her son. She went back to stripping, unable to resist the easy money. Susan would say she was like an addict and that the whole sex business was kind of like an addiction. And she was trying to break this addiction. She will talk endlessly on an intellectual level against dancing. And sometimes with great articulation, you know, you feel like this is very profound stuff. And then, you know, she's out there doing it. Hey, Natalie, lunch in half an hour, okay? Eventually, Susan landed an internship at New York's freewheeling newspaper, The Village Voice. Because of her background as a stripper, she was assigned to research the sex industry. She soon turned up a hot story. Russian mobsters in New Jersey were allegedly forcing young immigrant women to work like slaves in strip clubs. A van guy? Mm -hmm. I think he's gonna take me to the head guy. The head of the mob? Mm -hmm. When are you supposed to be out there? Tonight, 11 o'clock, right Susan here. was a fantastic researcher. She really poured herself into this. She spent hour after hour, day after day. Then she got into the situation where the people uh, were alleged to be in organized crime. The managers in these clubs began to side with the Russian women against the Russian manager. So it was like the two mobs meet. And Susan then, of course, loved this thing, and she got right in the middle of it. Susan earned praise for her Russian mob article, but she also received serious threats when it was published. But that didn't stop Susan from taking another dark assignment. This time, investigating vampire nightclubs. These clubs attracted kids called goths. They were known for their outrageous black outfits, but some took it further, even drinking real blood. 
Susan was attracted to the vampire world. She even started dating a man who claimed to be one of the undead. Susan wrote a detailed article, but she seemed to lose her journalistic objectivity. She sort of like took it in whole cloth, and she believed a lot of the things that these guys were telling her about how there were secret murders and so on and so forth in the vampire world. Are there a lot of regulars um, at the clubs? She would come and say to me, I met these two guys and they got this van and it's very scary and I don't know whether I should go in their van. And so I said, you know, hey, look, um, don't go in the van <laughs> because they might not be vampires, you know. To Susan's disappointment, the village voice never ran her vampire story. She went back to dancing full time. In a documentary made by a friend, Susan talked about the toll stripping had taken on her life. It's draining me, and I've been in it four and a half years, four years too long, I'd say. And I'm stuck in this conundrum because I feel so drained. And I'm damaged right now, I will admit that. Very damaged from this business. I'm hurting very bad. I was with her two days before she disappeared, and she said she had bronchitis, emphysema, and an ulcer. She said she'd been in the hospital twice that week. Um, she talked about her mood swings and being depressed, um, and about just holding on to live. You'll be back, right? Oh, uh, yeah, just a few minutes, right? 48 hours after Jill last saw her, Susan disappeared. Did she collapse because of her depression and poor health? Or was she out there waiting for help? Susan's friends had to consider darker theories. I think Susan was probably pretty hooked on drugs. And I think she went out and probably called somebody to come and get her. And then she went and she uh, may very well have OD'd. And she may very well have OD'd in the presence of someone who knew her and was frightened to uh, do anything about it. The police have a completely different theory. I believe that Susan Walsh is alive. Uh, for some unknown reason to me at this time, she opted to leave her family and home, which she has a perfect right to do. A number of people, including an old friend, Melissa Hines, told the police that they saw Susan after she disappeared. Susan! Susan! I definitely think it was her. I'm positive that I seen Susan a month after she disappeared. The license plate number that Melissa Hines provided to us, we did uh, track down, we spoke to the owner and operator of that vehicle. He had been with a woman fitting the description of Susan. He did view photographs and felt he was pretty sure that it had been her, but again, we had no positive identification of Susan Walsh at that time. Melissa believes that if Susan is alive, she may be deliberately hiding out. Susan definitely felt that she was in danger. She was scared for her life, and I think she was also scared her son's life could be in danger, too. Susan actually told me that she wasn't going to make it in the next year. She felt that she, that she was going to be killed. I believe there's a chance that the mob was after her. People in organized crime were concerned that Susan had information that would send them to jail. According to Susan, that was the, the case. Someone was definitely following Susan. I thought at first that it was just her imagination, but um, I seen it with my own eyes. I would see cars follow her, both of us. People follow her. My car, she was in my car. Somebody was uh, stalking her. Who was it that could have been following Susan? No one knows, but now years after she vanished, Police believe she was murdered, and the case remains open. If you have any information about Susan Walsh, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.
Next, 16 tons of gold is missing. The man who knew its location is dead, but he did leave behind a few intriguing clues. Farmington, New Mexico, 1933. In the heat of the summer, a pilot named Red Mosher lands several mysterious flights in the desert. There, he's met by a Mexican millionaire named Leon Trabuco. These two men have a secret. It's believed that Leon Trabuco and four other men were quietly buying up much of Mexico's gold reserves. And then they planned to resell it in the United States when the price went up. Lindo. Trabuco was convinced that because of the Great Depression, the United States would soon devalue the dollar and that gold prices would skyrocket. But the chance to make huge profits carried huge risks. The gold had to be smuggled into the United States. If the men were caught, they faced long prison terms. At a makeshift Mexican foundry, gold coins and jewelry were melted down and cast into ingots. In less than three months, the partners had collected almost 16 tons of solid gold. So, Mr. Trabuco, this is the property I was telling you about. Lots of space to store stuff. Trabuco searched the U.S. for a safe place to hide the illegal treasure. When he couldn't find a suitable spot, he decided it would be smarter to bury the gold. Ah, uh, it's too big. I need something a little more secluded. Secluded. Legend has it that Trabuco chose a sparsely populated region of New Mexico near the Ute and Navajo Indian reservations. Red Mosier allegedly made 16 flights, carrying one ton of gold each time. Pickup trucks then transported it to a secret burial site. Trabuco never revealed the location to his co-conspirators, and he never made a map. Six months after the final shipment was delivered, the Gold Reserve Act of 1934 became law. The price of gold soared. Overnight, the men's potential profit increased by $7 million. The group decided not to sell the gold, hoping the price would go even higher. But they were not aware of an executive order related to the gold act. It declared that after January 1934, private ownership of gold within the U.S. was illegal. The partners had missed their chance to strike it rich. Well, when FDR put the gold embargo, that takes gold off of the market. It's illegal, and so consequently, these five men from financiers from Mexico City, they had 20 ton of junk. It was not worth, worth a dime because they couldn't sell it for anything. The gold seemed to bring bad luck. Within five years, three of the partners had died untimely deaths. Over the next two decades, Trabuco was unable to sell the now illegal gold. When he died, he apparently took the secret location to his grave. For 35 years, Ed Foster has searched for Trabuco's treasure in the desert around Farmington, New Mexico. He's convinced that he found the 1933 landing strip used by Red Mosier. It's on a plateau called Conger Mesa. I believe that Conger Mesa is where the plane would adjust and come in and land. 
I met this Indian lady that uh, couldn't speak English, so I got an interpreter. She said she had watched that plane land there many, many times. Ed interviewed another Navajo woman who was six years old in 1933. She remembered several Mexican men who lived on the reservation. This would be very unusual for a Mexican to move out here. For a Spanish or a white man to move out here and live would be unheard of. 20 miles west of the Mesa, near an old Navajo home, stands a building unlike any other on the reservation. Ed believes that it was built by men Trabuco hired to guard the gold. This house has windows, a front door and a back door, and it had a veranda. To me, this house would look good in Tijuana, Mexico, but not on the Navajo reservation. Ed also found another intriguing clue. It was etched in the face of a stone outcropping. He calls it Shrine Rock and believes it may be the key to finding Trabuco's treasure. This is 1933. 16 T O N. Ed is sure that the gold is buried somewhere within this triangle formed by Conger Mesa. Shrine Rock, and the Mexican-style home. Ed asked renowned treasure hunter Norman Scott to make a detailed survey of the area. I get an awful lot of stories coming to us after 30 years in the business, and probably about 80 or 90% of them you have to uh, talk up to some fictional writer who's writing a book or magazine, but this one has a ring of authenticity to it. I have looked with my eyes and metal detectors for many years, and now they have technology, and that's why I think it's going to be found with technology. It's not going to be found with dumb luck, because I've spent all of that. Is Ed Foster just chasing a legend? Or does the desert of New Mexico hold a secret to Leon Trabuco's long-lost fortune? We may never know. Next, a dead woman's diary reveals shocking details of sexual harassment and possibly holds the key to her murder. Boston's Logan Airport. 24-year-old Sue Taraskowitz was a trailblazer. She was a woman working in a man's world, on the tarmac of the airport. Hook up the ground power and put the AC on the aircraft. Sue loved being on the ramp. She liked doing the job. Sometimes she'd come home and say, I lift a million bags today, and they were 200 pounds each. She'd make a joke out of it. But she never came complaining about the job. She loved it. Yeah, you don't have to do the paperwork. Sue was the second woman to ever work for Northwest Airlines as a ground service employee. She worked her way up from cleaning the interiors of jets. After three years, she was promoted to ramp supervisor. She was the first woman to ever hold that position. See that? I know it's not oil. I call you guys. Shortly after beginning her new job, Sue's car was discovered at an auto body shop not far from the airport. See, see if you can pop that trunk latch, will you? In the trunk was Sue's body. Oh, she had been beaten and then stabbed multiple times. There was no sign of robbery or rape, so her family assumed that she was the victim of a random crime. For more than a year, Sue's family grieved. Then at Christmas time, Marlene Taraskowitz finally went into her daughter's room for the first time since the murder. What she found there was shocking. I tried many times to go in Sue's room. You know, you just, you've got to do this. It's a year. You know you should. Let me get something that was special to her, and we'll just put it out. And I started going into her closet, and I saw a briefcase there. Inside Sue's briefcase, 
was a diary. In vivid detail, she described the sexual harassment that she had endured on the job. Ugly incidents she never mentioned to her family. The journal included examples of the graffiti, insulting, demeaning, and lurid that had been etched in the men's rooms at the airport and even in the cargo holds of jets. What I read, the filth that somebody would write about my Susan. And I thought, is this why she was murdered? And we thought, this is it. We have solved Susan's murder. In page after page, Sue described acts of hostility. The following is typical. April 12th, 1989. Bobby came into the break room. Hey, that's my radio! What? That's my radio. I'll buy you a new one. What'd you do that for? The Bruins lost. He left the room and one of my coworkers picked up the radio and plugged it in to see if it still worked. Yay! Hey. Thanks. Bobby came back into the room. Sue's boyfriend, who also worked at the airport, spoke to Bobby and demanded that he replace the radio. Then, later that day, Sue confronted Bobby. Come on, Bobby. That was the radio that my mother got me for Christmas. What are you going to do, send another punk boyfriend over here again? Is he going to beat me up? He's lucky I didn't kill him. Sue filed many formal complaints with the management of Northwest Airlines and her union, but little was done to stop the harassment. In fact, it increased, often in the form of nasty graffiti. It wasn't apparently just one or two pieces of graffiti that made their way up and then were washed away. It was repeated cases of um, graffiti of varying kinds, in some cases amounting to death threats against other workers. Um, who were supporting Sue. A Sue also talks in her diary about getting anonymous phone calls um, all hours of the night. She records some of the times the phone calls happen. Who's there? Get off our backs, Sue T, baby. Who is this? She also had instances where her car was vandalized. Her boyfriend's car was vandalized. Friends who were supporting her had their cars vandalized. Despite the abuse, hey. Sue's career hadn't slowed down. She was promoted to ramp supervisor and put in charge of the employees that she had once okay, well, worked with the on the tarmac. Package, but I need you to take your crew and get the next two flights. Initially, yeah. Sue was passed over for the promotion. A man in her union had illegally bid for the job so Sue filed a grievance Hi, and won. Um, but the victory made some of her co-workers uncomfortable. A lot of them felt that they didn't want any females being their boss, that that should be a man's job. It didn't stop her from coming to work. Um, it didn't stop her from standing up to things that she thought was wrong. Some good OT, huh? Ching. Are you going to get to spend some of your hard-earned money? Yeah, right. Like, between this and my supervising shifts, when? A few months after Sue's promotion, the graffiti became more sinister. Maybe taking a break. I am so sick of this. I'm going to go on a sandwich run to the roast beef place. I'll go. You're no. running all over tonight. Huh? No, these guys are working hard. I want to treat them. So how During a graveyard shift, Sue volunteered to go pick up sandwiches for her crew. She never returned, and no one reported her missing for a day and a half. Authorities now believe that Sue's death may have been connected to a federal investigation of Northwest Airlines that took place that summer. Some baggage handlers were operating a stolen credit card ring. When shipments of new cards were transported on Northwest jets, a group of workers was stealing them, using them, and then selling them. The scam netted over $7 million. Eventually, 10 Northwest employees were indicted and convicted. To Marlene, some of the names were very familiar. They were names of people that were in Sue's diary that had sexually harassed her from day one. 
I believe that Susan was set up by her co-workers, that for whatever reason, they were afraid that Susan was going to squeal on something. As far as the airport's concerned, a lot of people there knew her. A lot of people knew what was going on around her. We've talked to a lot of them. They've given us information. But I think we all believe that somebody there has more. Northwest Airlines declined our request to be interviewed for this story. But they have settled a sexual discrimination lawsuit brought against them by Sue's family. It was one of the largest discrimination settlements ever granted in the state of Massachusetts. Authorities still consider Sue's case open and active. Her family is offering a quarter million dollar reward for information leading to the arrest of Sue's killer. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, one of your tips helps find the killer of a popular Los Angeles DJ. Los Angeles, California. Four friends climbed on their motorcycles to cruise the nearly deserted streets late at night. It had become a regular weekend ritual. One of the riders was Lee Selwyn, a popular DJ in LA. But this night, his experience was different. One of the other riders got into an argument when a passing car tried to run him down. What are you trying to do? When the driver spit at Lee's friend, the night turned up. The four riders scattered. A chase began. Although Lee was an innocent bystander, he became the target. The chase went on for nearly 30 city blocks. Lee Selwyn was thrown 180 feet from his bike and suffered a massive skull fracture. He was rushed to the hospital, but died within hours. I received a call from Cedars. They said that he was in the intensive care and I knew I just knew he was such a big part of my life he was my buddy he wasn't just my son he was my buddy the Los Angeles police began a citywide manhunt but Lee Selwyn's killer had skipped town update after the broadcast of Lee's story a viewer called unsolved mysteries he claimed that there was a prisoner in Georgia who had often bragged about running down a biker in L.A. The Los Angeles police obtained a mugshot of the suspect, and Lee's friends picked the man out of a photo lineup. His name, Franklin LeGrand Perkins. Just five days before Perkins was scheduled for parole, he was arrested. One week later, he was back in Los Angeles to face murder charges. Most murder victims know their attackers, know their killers. But this is a case that, that just wasn't that way. This was a random event uh, of, of a person who was basically minding his own business and, and unfortunately was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Franklin Perkins turned out to be a member of the Pagos Motorcycle Gang. He was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Danbury, Connecticut. Early one morning, the emergency team at a local hospital springs into action. One of their patients, a man registered as Tom Hughes, is in cardiac arrest. Doctors work to revive him. However, after 90 minutes, Tom Hughes is pronounced dead. When the hospital attempts to contact the man's wife, they discover that her name and phone number are bogus. 
So are his social security number, address, occupation, and employer. Tom Hughes simply does not exist. It turns out that Hughes was a con man and professional hospital patient. He moved from hospital to hospital, living in each for three to seven days before sneaking out without paying his bills. It appears that Tom would check into a hospital with some sort of small self-inflicted wound and uh, have a complaint of a lower back pain. We think that he was checking himself into the hospitals to obtain the pain pills. Well, I'm going to prescribe something a bit stronger, and I'd like to suggest that you check yourself in for observation. Whatever you say, you're the doctor. We were able to determine that Tom had essentially been traveling across the country and staying in one hospital after another and taking a bus from uh, uh, one destination to another. We were able to track him from uh, California all the way to Rhode Island and points in between. Yes, my name is uh, Thomas Hughes. I need to speak with someone about a personal injury case. The now unidentified man made 16 calls before he died. I'm a civil engineer. Investigators yeah. traced them, hoping to locate family members. Instead, they discovered that every single call was made to an attorney. We think he called the attorneys with a story that he wanted to have a lawsuit because of his uh, injuries at work. But uh, I think the real reason he called the attorneys was to, again, tell a story to someone and uh, borrow some money. He needed travel money, and uh, he would obtain this by borrowing small amounts from the attorneys. Update. As a result of our broadcast, the man known as Tom Hughes has been identified as Thomas Patrick White. Police believe White suffered from Munchausen syndrome, a condition in which a healthy person seeks constant medical attention. Unfortunately, the disorder may have cost White his life. Let's do it again. Charge. 